Good afternoon, this is Cody Silverberg. And if you're hearing this, that means that I must not have made it to Bismarck, probably because of some bad roads. And I'm very disappointed, but I appreciate having you uh, for your program in any case. I work as a, a scientist at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. I work as a consultant, and I work on the livestock integration there. This is a story I came across a few years ago, a wonderful story about a group of nuns who are building a new monastery and they're using hand labor and natural stone and they're, they're building it to last. And here's a quote from the leader of the congregation. In a hundred years, we'll begin the story. Right now, we're laying the groundwork for those who will come after us. And I just want you to imagine for a second, what would agriculture be different? How, how would it be different if we took that perspective you know, that we are just beginning and in a hundred years we'll begin the story. You know, what would we be doing differently? I think that one of the things we might be doing differently is we could have more livestock. We'd have more animals on the land. Why are some of the reasons? Well, save our soil. You know, we need more perennials and more cover crops to keep our soil healthy. Uh, if you have livestock, you can cycle nutrients faster. And also you don't have to sell as many nutrients if they if you're selling animals, you don't export as many nutrients from your farm. Uh, we'll be able to produce more food and fiber per acre by utilizing uh, crop residues and things like that. We'll be able to produce food and energy more locally. We learned during these past few years with this pandemic what it's like uh, when our supply chains break down. Of course, it op opens opportunities for economic gain and everybody almost likes animals. So what are some of the concrete ways that we go about doing this at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm? Well, we grow soybeans, corn, and flax, all oil seeds, and we press them. Why does that matter? Well, because when we press them, we, we create oil, which we could, uh, if we had the right machinery, you know, use to operate machinery. And the oil, or we could sell it, right? So we burn it or we sell it, but in any case, Everything in that oil, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, it comes from the atmosphere, it comes from water, so we can get that back easily. The byproduct of pressing it is that we get this meal. And it, what's in the meal? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all these other soil nutrients. And so what we can do is we feed that meal to the cattle and it goes right back onto our own land. So everything we burn or sell, in this case, is something we get back from water and the atmosphere. And everything we keep on the farm is the nutrients that came from our soil. Uh, plus nitrogen, which uh, may have come from the atmosphere, but in any case, we're happy to have it put back in our soil. And the meal is highly nutritious for cattle, 80% TDN, 40% crude protein. It's a fabulous supplement. Here are a couple pictures of steers that we are field finishing out at the research farm. And this concept of field finishing is that we'll bring animals all the way to a slaughter weight so we can take them to the butcher without ever uh, sending them to a feedlot. Now they are not grass fed because we are doing things like I just showed you, feeding meal. Uh, sometimes we also feed other grain products that we produced on farm. So here's the challenge that we presented to ourselves. How long can we keep our animals and the nutrients that they eat on our land? And that might mean all the way to finishing. It might not mean all the way to finishing. But the longer we can keep them on the land, the more nutrients we can cycle back onto our own land. So to give you a numerical example of why this matters, how much it matters, suppose you had a 500-pound calf and you fed him for six months and he was gaining 2.1 pounds per day. That's not very much for a feedlot. That'd be very low for a feedlot, but it is uh, reasonable for out on pasture. And this probably wouldn't take the calf to finishing either, but it's just a six month period. Well, this is what happens in terms of nutrients. If that calf is on your field grazing, you are gonna remove some nitrogen, nine pounds. Uh, that's because the calf is growing and it needs that nitrogen to develop muscle. And, to, and so when the calf leaves, he's taking some nitrogen with him. Uh, also phosphorus, a couple pounds of phosphorus. You know, growing bones is one of the, the areas that that phosphorus goes to and or some organic matter is going to leave your field. In contrast, if that if you harvest all that forage that the calf ate and you send it to a feedlot, you're going to remove a lot more nitrogen, a lot more phosphorus. 
Now, some of that, especially the phosphorus, you could get back if you just if you put the manure back on your field. But in a lot of cases, we know when we sell hay or we sell grain or we sell something that gets fed to animals, rarely does it come back to our own animals. Uh, this is working fairly well for us. Our, are actually gaining around two pounds a day for our calves after we've weaned them in, on that process all the way to finishing weights. Okay, now I'm taking my scientist hat off here briefly and putting on a marketing hat, which is probably a little dangerous for me to do. But anyway, I went on to walmart.com the other day and I found the price of an Angus steak burger versus an Impossible burger. An Impossible burger is a lot more expensive. But it's made in a factory, and I assume they're going to get better and better at it because it's a new process. So what happens when that Impossible Burger gets down to be just as cheap as the, the beef burger? Our consumers are going to be faced with a choice where they want their food to come from, right? They're already faced with that choice. This is pretty much what it is. Um, I, you know, from a marketing perspective, I'd like to offer this choice instead. And, you know, when the cost of the, the protein products is the same, I think we'll have a, a better chance selling beef if this is the story we can and as part of that story uh, we can think of beef as as similar to wine or coffee tea chocolate basically as a story there's a story behind the food we need to take good care of the land and the animals and we need to tell people how we take good care of the land and the animals and with beef i think we could develop this idea of terroir of beef that is that the basically that the environment that the beef is raised in influences the the properties of it and so the the taste would be influenced by where it came from okay taking the marketing hat off and putting the scientific hat back on which makes me a lot more comfortable and here we we have another example of what we're doing at dakota lakes you can see some calves out there grazing during the winter a little bit of snow on the ground i had to take this picture last year because until the last you know we haven't had snow at Dakota Lakes as of when I'm recording this. And so, or I should say very little. There there has been a little bit, but not enough to be concerned about. Anyway, in this picture, you can see that we have a, a fence in the background hanging from one of our irrigators. And so what we do is we move this irrigator every day and that rations out the swaths to the calves over the course of the season. This is a, these are cover crop swaths that we planted right after wheat harvest. And then we cut them in uh, you know, late September or early October. And we just leave them lying. Now one of the questions when it comes to cover crops is to fertilize or not. And you can see here a trial that we did a couple years ago with different strips. And you can see the differences, you know, where we fertilized and where we didn't fertilize. And one of the interesting things that happened a couple years ago was that where we had fertilized, after we cut the swaths, we saw that the fertilized crop grew back and the, the non-fertilized area didn't. And that's why you see some green stripes and yellow stripes here. When it comes to how much we actually produced with the fertilizer, uh, we did in, on our irrigated fields, we did increase our yield somewhat. And that extra forage, if as I calculated out, the, what's the value of that extra forage? Is it actually worth the nitrogen that we put out there? Well, uh, when I originally did the calculation of nitrogen at 39 cents a pound, the additional forage only cost $40 per ton. <clears throat> it seemed like an obvious, uh, a good thing for us to do. Uh, now, recalculating at a dollar per pound of nitrogen, the extra forage cost $100 per ton, and that might still be okay. Uh, trade-off, but it doesn't sound near as good as $40 per ton. Keep in mind, though, a lot of that nitrogen is staying on the field. So even if the cover crop, well, I mean, because the cover crop is capturing the nitrogen, it's storing it there. The animals eat the cover crop, but most of the nitrogen goes right back into the soil. So it's it's $100 per ton of additional forage. That was the cost of the nitrogen, but you know that nitrogen, a lot of it's going to hang around for. A now on the dryland field. We did this the same experiment on the dryland field, uh, but we couldn't find a statistical difference between the fertilized and the non-fertilized areas. And I think there was probably really some difference, but it's just not as big. And it's not surprising because uh, without as much moisture on the dryland field, the cover crop probably wasn't able to capture as much nitrogen. 
and would just was a little bit less productive perhaps. Uh, in any case, the uh, today's prices of nitrogen, the extra forage that we produced on the fertilized area cost $150 per ton, and that's uh, getting marginal in terms of whether or not it would be worth it. Of course, we've got that caveat that the nitrogen is most of it still going to be in the field. Okay, so <clears throat> once we've got these cover crops on the ground, uh, what happens to their quality? And so I'm going to start off by showing you uh, a bad example here, 2021. What happened in 2021? When we cut these cover crops initially, you can see that we had very good quality, above 60% TDN. And TDN is a measure of the energy. It's kind of like looking at the calories on the back of your cereal box. How many? And, and when it comes to cattle that we're trying to get fat, you know, we want as much uh, calories, we want as much TDN as possible. So we started out great, but what happened to our weather in 2021? Well, typically we would be cool and dry in the fall. In 2021, in contrast, we were hot and wet. And so in a normal year, when we cut these swaths and around the 1st of October, it's kind of like putting them in the refrigerator and they're pretty well conserved over the winter. I'm not saying they don't degrade some, but they, they stay pretty well conserved. In 2021, because of the hot and the wet, it was almost like we set them on the, the counter and kept spraying them with a, a water bottle. And you know, they degraded very quickly. That, and that's what we can see here. We lost a lot of TDN, a lot of energy in those. Now, I have those, those same purple lines for this year still on the chart. I'm showing you some past years now at the same time. And you can see that what happened in the past years is that Yes, we saw a decline. You know, these lines are all sloped down. Over the winter, we lost energy, but we don't have that really steep decline like happened in 2021. And I attribute that to the primarily to the weather. When we look at protein, the story is uh, similar. This is all you know, quite a few different years, four different years of protein measurements. But so, so generally speaking, on the protein, we lose some protein over winter but the trend is much less difficult to detect here. In some cases, we actually gain protein. In some cases, we lose protein. It's, it's not a consistent result like we see with the energy. We fall calve, and so, you know, that, that creates some, some different uh, management around fall calving rather than spring calving. And for the most part, we have done very well with our pregnancy rate. Now, because of fall calving, that means we're breeding in November and December. Well, we have been over 90% every year, except we had one real clunker in 2019, where we only hit 63%. And I think that was due to, we had a very cold uh, November and December, it was, you know, compared to normal, very, very cold. And uh, our animals, our cows actually were losing weight. And in retrospect, I wish we had given them uh, some additional grain supplementation or something to maintain their body condition because I think because of that cold weather, uh, they were really they were declining in body condition and low pregnancy rates. Uh, what does it cost <clears throat> to do this uh, swath grazing? And so I'm, I'm showing you here the past few years and we uh, you know we had some variability from one year to the next. This is a, you know, it's a relatively new system for us. So we're trying out some different things, seeing what works and what doesn't work. So this first year, 2019, you can see we did not allocate as much swath acres or as much cover crop acres uh, as the following year. And th this is the year that we had trouble getting all the cows bred, okay? And then in 2020, we, we gave them quite a bit. We were quite generous. And then in 2021, this past year, we were kind of intermediate in terms of how much uh, cover crop swath and how much corn residue we're giving them. Because on any given day, we let them have some of both. Some We give them some new swath and we give them some new corn residue. If you look at the economics of that, uh, and we're also giving them some grain supplement, typically uh, during the winter. And so you can see, um, you know, the grain supplement cost has varied from one year to the next. and in the, these past couple years, these numbers are kind of high, and that's partly because we have had some yearlings with the cows, the yearlings that we're trying to finish. 
And so we're trying to push them to gain weight. And, uh, and they have, and our, our cows have gotten fat too. So our, our cows got, you know, too skinny in 2019 and we, you know, perhaps we overcompensated, but in any case, um, this level of feeding in these last couple of years is probably higher than what's really necessary. And then if we look at the cover crop swaths, you know, how much did that cost us? You know, it's not very expensive on, on a daily basis. And a little bit of hay, now I put this on a dollars per cow per day, but really the, the hay cost, it doesn't, it's not as though we're giving them a little bit of hay every day. We just use hay uh, occasionally when we really need it, you know, there's a storm coming and we want it, we feed them a bale down in the draw so they can get some protection from the storm or in the spring when the soils are wet and we want to get the cattle off of the fields for a, a few days and let the, the soils dry out a little, let the water drain uh, down into the soil profile. So we'll feed them some hay off field just to get them off the field for a little while. So I just averaged that hay out over the whole winter. And then you look at our total feed costs uh, way over on the right. And, you know, we have a, a fairly wide range of costs there. We're really kind of uh, dialing this in still. I think we can do better th than that um, with a little bit of, uh, you know, learning from the lessons of the past and, and applying those to our future management. So how has this grazing on our crop fields affected our crops? Well, uh, I've been measuring, hand measuring corn yield uh, every year for the past several years. And in 2019, we found, you know, from, I, I measured several fields anywhere from no difference up to losing 11 bushels of corn per acre because of the grazing, okay? But in 2020, I found, again, one, there was one field, there was no difference due to grazing, but another field, uh, we actually gained 19 bushels to the acre due to grazing. And in 2021, I measured a couple different fields and I found no difference from one field to the other. So takeaway is uh, yield differences due to grazing have been small, if any, and they have not been consistent every year from, from one year to the next. What's it done to our soils? Uh, again, you know, we've been looking at the soils for a couple of years and winter grazing when i measured in 2020 i found that the winter grazing really didn't affect the bulk density and it it had a little bit of effect on soil moisture not very much. and one of the reasons that we find a limited impact i think is because this is what our our soil surface typically looks like when we're grazing in winter uh, so this would have been this is wheat stubble that's what's still kind of or actually the the wheat stubble is lying on the ground we used a stripper header and so you've got a lot of wheat stubble on the ground, and then you can see the, the stems, uh, the lighter colored stems of the cover crop sticking up where we had hated them off. And so what you what's noticeable, notable, sorry, about this picture is that there's very little uh, actual soil that you can see. You know, for the most part, what you see is residue. And so if a hoof, imagine a cow hoof um, stepping here, well, she's gonna her hoof is gonna land on the residue rather than actually making contact with the soil surface. And because we move the fences every day, you know, we change where the, that cow impact is with the exception of cattle trails, because we only move the forward fence. We don't move the back fence every day. And, you know, that happens um, on a monthly basis, more or less, that we would move the back fence. All right, so uh, also in 2020, now this is a summer grazing example. And I came out into this field immediately, uh, like the day after we finished grazing this, this forage crop field. And I did find a little bit of a difference in bulk density going from one to 1.5. Now 1.15 is still quite low. So that's not really something we need to be concerned about. When I went back to this field the next year, I found there was no difference anymore. So whatever impact this cattle had had on bulk density had, been, had disappeared over the course of that year. Uh, in 2021, on the fields that had been grazed over winter, I did find a little bit of increase in bulk density. This is uh, on the order of what I found in that other, the field I just showed you with the summer grazing. I suspect that uh, if I come back and measure this again, you know, a year later, we'll find that there is no longer any difference here. 
All right, perennials. This, now this is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> Wonderful, amazing perennials. They do all kinds of great stuff for you, from erosion, organic matter, saline seeps, diversity, capture deep nutrients, draw down the water table, and they're just darn beautiful. Lots of reasons to want. So one of the things we're trying out at Dakota Lakes is uh, this rotation of five years of perennial pasture with 15 years of pasture. So it looks kind of like this. You do wheat, corn, sorghum, pea, canola, flax. You do all that for 15 years. And then you slip in five years of perennial before you go back to the annual again. This is a video from a couple years ago. This is a switchgrass field. And we actually interceded. July 3rd, 2020. Switchgrass. Uh, switchgrass is a native worm season. The calves grass. have just moved into so that's our, that's a new strip in this to graze. And then the peas is. This is a stand well. of switchgrass. You know, and just part of it. Uh, including the part you see here, has been interceded with so peas, and the calves' first choice, of course, is to eat the forage. And then in 2021, this is this is actually a different field, but same idea: switchgrass pea mix, and it just it was awful because we didn't have the rain, you know. So in so in a good precipitation year. It, it looks like that video in a bad precipitation year, you know, I can barely get to my knee and uh, the peas didn't do well, the switchgrass didn't do well either. Uh, stay, taking a step back to that good year in 2020, uh, when we measured the, the quality of that forage, well, dry, I guess dry mass first, what we see is that the switchgrass, whether it was grown with the pea or by itself, there wasn't much difference in how much grass production we had. But with the pea, we also had the pea production, and so we got a big uh, increase in overall yield there. And then in 2021, <laughs> in the dry year, we saw you know a more of a, a difference in switchgrass yield. We we lost switchgrass yield when we had it combined with the pea, and the yields were way lower in 21 than they were. In Quality wise. There, uh, we thought maybe some nitrogen would move from the pea over to the switchgrass, and we see that really didn't happen. Not much of a difference. But the pea is high in protein, and so just by having the pea there, we really improved the diet quality. Uh, one of the challenges if, with having a, a perennial, and especially a perennial that you only intend to keep for five years, is that establishment period, which could last two, three, or more years and you don't get much productivity. And so what we did is we tried actually planting switchgrass with wheat, that's what you see over on the right hand side here, planted it with winter wheat, and then what you see here is after we had harvested the wheat uh, in July, the switchgrass continues to grow because it's a warm season grass. And we and it did quite well. Uh, we followed up the next year, that field rotated into corn. And so here's the corn and switchgrass growing together. Later that year, the corn is now senesce, the switchgrass is still nice and green. And so uh, the switchgrass survived through all this. It's Maybe it's a crazy idea, but uh, what we've ended up doing is we've managed to get two years of grain harvest while establishing that perennial. And then when our, our perennial, when we finally finished all five years of that perennial, and we had to go back to the annual rotation. We just have one year of data on that so far, and this is not replicated, uh, but we see that the, the wheat following switchgrass, that's the middle line, so it was intermediate between our yields um, for wheat following peas and wheat following canola. All right, now to our perennial pasture. Uh, this pasture, the Shields pasture, uh, had been dominated by exotic cool season grasses, smooth brome and crested wheatgrass predominantly. And so we wanted to get back more of the native grasses, more warm season grasses in here. So we did some herbicide treatments, and that's what you can see in this picture, brown areas where we had herbicide strips, uh, mostly glyphosate. And then we also did some seeding treatments, and we changed the grazing management, which had been continuous season-long grazing, changed it to short duration, high intensity grazing. And we thought maybe just changing the grazing will allow some of native warm season species to uh, really uh, rise from the seed bed or, or bud bank or something. And so that's what this experiment was for, different combinations of seeding and herbicide and 
and it's a new grazing, high and low density grazing. Uh, <clears throat> we had two really dry years to start with. And so that really slowed down our establishment. But this is year four of the experiment. And this picture illustrates the, the pasture very well uh, because what you see here, you see some really good looking uh, big blue stem plants in the foreground. And this is on June 22nd. So those cool season grasses are not much good for grazing at this point. But the, the big blue stem does look good. But you also see a lot of annual weeds <laughs> that aren't as, uh, aren't as attractive to cattle for grazing. And so a lot of diversity um, and some, certainly some success with trying to get some native tall grass C4 species established, but patchy success, okay? This is what it looked like later in the year. I mean, a lot of these plants now are taller than me. You know, they were uh, five, six, seven feet tall. And in parts of this pasture, just, it was really beautiful. Summary of the results, you don't need to <laughs> follow everything down at the bottom. Uh, what you're seeing here is success of getting those tall grasses established. Where we didn't seed, we found no success. Okay, where we seeded, but we didn't apply a roundup, no success. Apparently the cool season grasses were just too competitive and didn't allow, especially under the drought conditions we had for establishment, didn't allow them to establish. But where we seeded and applied roundup, we had some success. About one plant every square yard or every square meter. So that is what I have for you today. I would love to answer questions for a little bit if that's possible. And I wanted to acknowledge our funding sources, uh, the NRCS, Howard Buffett Foundation, Dakota Lakes Research Farm, South Dakota State University, and the others who have participated in this work because there's a lot more here than one person can do. So thank you to Dwayne, Gary, John, Wyatt, Chauncey, Sam, and all the students and others who helped us with this work.